just a couple more minutes. Uh, if you can uh, usher friends and neighbors in, into the room, we'll, we'll get started. Don't forget to sign up for auction pieces. So there's uh, things in the hallway, there's also things in the back as part of auction. So great stuff out there.
I would argue that they are not coming back to do that. And that no one will come and do that unless that someone is us. Did you know you are someone's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? You are someone's Mother Teresa. You can be someone's Nelson Mandela. You can be someone's John Brown, who was a white man who fought for abolition and gave his life for the fight for abolition. You can be someone's John Wesley, who, who in England stood up against a parliament and said that slavery was morally and should be illegally outlawed in England. You can be that person for someone. But typically we are not that person because we are hiding behind our shame and our embarrassment. How many times have you seen a situation go down in front of you? Or you heard someone give a, a side comment and you knew that that situation was wrong or that that side comment was inappropriate and that that was also wrong. How many people have heard those things before or have been in those situations? This next part, don't answer this out loud, but I want you to answer it in your head. It's a rhetorical question, so, so just keep it to yourself. But how many times have you seen that and you've actually not said anything? See, part of what we, we've been conditioned to do is that they, they've conditioned us to, to be divided so that they can conquer. Divided and conquered. And we end up with these obstacle illusions. Obstacle, illusions, barriers to recognizing our humanity. Obstacle, illusions. And so one of those obstacle illusions is, is race. Another is, is gender, uh, social economic status. And so I want to talk a little bit about those so we can talk about how do we pierce those obstacle illusions so that we don't keep people bound because we won't speak up. And so the, the first is historical trauma, that was one of those obstacle illusions. And anyone familiar with that concept of historical trauma? All right. So what are the, the tenets, or what does that mean, historical trauma? Marco. <laughs> so what does that mean, historical trauma? So things that have been passed down from previous generations, like her or, or ways of thinking, and that continue to be passed down. Um, how many people have had a car stolen from you? Anyone had a car stolen? Okay. What, what, what was the kind of car? Green Stratus. It was a green Stratus. So if you saw your green Stratus, would you know that that was your car? Yes. Yes, you would. All right, cool. So can I use your green Stratus for the story? All right? Historical trauma, historical trauma, particularly as it pertains to uh, Native Americans. So, his, uh, so your green stratus, you go to work, and um, you come home, you park your stratus in your parking space. You wake up the next morning, Tuesday morning, the stratus is gone. What assumption do you make? <laughs> that someone stole your stratus. So what do you do when you discover that the stratus is not there? So you call the police. And I don't know if anybody else has this experience, but anytime I've called the police, they come, they take a report, and then they go back to doing what they were doing before. I always thought they should come with a CSI kit. <laughs> take down some tire tracks, measures, and pictures, something. A crime has been committed. But they take a report, and then they go back to what they're doing, and they leave you with this little car. Right? So let's say you come home Wednesday night, and you see that your green stratus is in your neighbor's parking space. What do you do? <laughs> so you visit your neighbor, right? And what do you, when you visit your neighbor, what do you say? You say, neighbor, that's my car. And the neighbor says, no, it's my car. I bought it. And you say, I bought it. And they say, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. So you might have a confrontation with your, your, your neighbor. You might even try to go and steal your car back. But, but they have these uh, two giant um, Rottweiler shark tiger mixed dogs. <laughs> so you're like, you know what, I'll come back later. Right? And so finally, a couple of weeks go past, and you say, gosh, darn it, I'm fed up with this. 
So you, you get your paperwork, you take them to court. So you got the police report, you got the insurance, you got all your car changes, you got your title, you got everything. And you stand there and you give it to the judge, and the judge looks at it very carefully and pieces through each piece of that and looks at it. And then, um, and then the neighbor, the judge says, uh, neighbor, what do you have? And the neighbor says, um, I don't have anything, sir. Uh, it, 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 it's just my car. And so the, the, the judge goes, hmm. And so he looks at all your stuff, and he looks at the neighbor, and he looks at all your stuff, and then he makes his decision, and he says, the car goes to the neighbor. Wait a minute. How are you feeling about this justice system? Was it helpful that the police came to take a report? So that the police aren't helpful. The, the, the justice system isn't helpful. So now you go back home and the neighbor has your car and you're watching them drive your car to and fro and then the neighborhood decides that they want to do a car show for leukemia. They want to raise money for leukemia. And so the, the, so the, the neighborhood is going to do this. So the neighbor comes over to you and says, I know you know something about Dodge Green Stratasys. Could you help me prepare this car for the car show? What do you say to your neighbor that you can say out loud? Are you excited to be a part of this, 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 this thing that's actually for a good cause? Are you excited to be a part of the car show? No. What emotional state do you have about the fact that you can see your neighbor driving around with your car but there's nothing you can do about it? Do you feel happy about that? No. Are you encouraged to, to be a productive member of that community, given that this, this dude is drug, or lady is driving around in your car? I have a bit of an attitude. Right? You would have a bit of an attitude. Right? <laughs> Historical trauma for Native Americans. Can you imagine living a life, generation after generation after generation, seeing other people enjoy your stuff? And you not be able to do anything. And then the, those same people say to you, you know what, you can, um, you can use the car on Saturday from 10 to 10.30, um, but don't be late. And so we tell Native Americans where they can hunt and fish and how much and where and, and what kind of things they can do with their land. And then we wonder why to, uh, tobacco is a problem. We wonder why suicide is a problem. We wonder why alcohol is a problem. And because of that it, it internalized sense of oppression, I can't fight the system because we've done that and we see what happens. And I'd rather take myself out than to let this wicked system take me out. And so we have to install hope and, and provide hope for our Native Americans and brothers and sisters. And even the word trauma, uh, historical trauma gives the, 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 the impression that those are things that have happened in the past. When in fact, those are things that are happening every day in the lives of Native Americans, particularly those folks who find themselves on the res, which is one of those hot spots for poverty interventions. Right? The next is institutional racism. And institutional racism is simply this, uh, and I give it just this, um, the, the simple definition, that between 1863 and 1964, there's 101 years. And I would suggest that during that dark age, pun intended, that dark age of American history, any institution that was developed in that 101 years is a racist institution. That it is racist. Because not everybody had equal opportunity to goods, jobs, services, and money in that 101 years. Uh, and and we, did, we did some wonderful things. We added 22 states to the Union in that 101 years. We, uh, the, the Model T Ford was invented in that 120 years. Uh, in that 101 years. In that 101 years, we fought two world wars. We, uh, electricity became uh, something that was in people's homes. And all throughout that 101 years, not everybody had equal access to all of those great things that were happening in our country. Next, the, the idea of poverty is, it is problematic. And we'll, we'll work on some, uh, we'll do a poverty simulation in just a bit. Um, but poverty is problematic because poverty makes people think they're not as human as other people. Or tries to create a, a, a hierarchy, a hierarchy of humanity. What is one thing that is true about all human beings? 
we will die. <laughs> it's true. Unless you're a vampire. <laughs> or a zombie, you know, walking dead, because they're already dead. All right. And lastly, a barrier, an obstacle illusion, is this concept of whiteness. And whiteness is, is, is problematic. Um, because whiteness hangs on one thin spider web of belief. Does anybody know what that is? What holds whiteness together? What makes whiteness work? All right, so let's do this. Um, please raise your hand if your, your people group is, um, are from Sweden. Any, it doesn't matter how far, but you can go back as far as you Okay, German. All right. Um, Finnish. All right. Norwegian. Norwegians. <laughs> they always do not want to be left out. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. Uh, What's it? Italians! Yeah, Italians! Which I think is funny because Italy is closer to Africa than it is to Europe, but I'm not saying that. <laughs> right. Would we consider those groups to be white? Yeah, in HR forms, they consider those, those folks to be white. So, what does do Italians and Norwegians and Swedes and Germans? Do they look alike? No, they don't, right? Or, or even um, Irish, right? The, the, the Irish, they don't look alike. But we all call those groups white. So what does whiteness, the, what's the thin thread that, that sews this concept of whiteness together? That our skin color makes us the same. When in fact, it does not. All white people are not equal in their whiteness. <laughs> Listen to white people talk about other white people who don't measure up to the level of sophistication that most white people think they should. What do white people call white people who don't measure up? They call them white trash. What else do they call them? They call them what? Hillbillies. Call them rednecks. People spend a whole career off the rednecks, right? <laughs> and so that, that concept of whiteness as, as being equal is problematic. Here's another example, and, and I'll give it to you right now. So uh, you have four squares on your paper, right? So um, the first square, what I'd like you to do is I want you to identify your, your racial group, however you would, would determine your racial group. What's your racial group? In square one. HR version, your version, whatever, whatever, however you define it. <laughs> the second square, what I'd like you to do is I want you to write down one thing you like about being your race. One thing you like about being your race. And this is in the center of your, uh, the center of your hand out. I want you, to, uh, in the third square, I want you to write down one thing that embarrasses you about your race or your racial group. Is there anything that embarrasses you about your race or your racial group? And in the fourth square, I want you to write down what do you want people to know, or what, what might surprise people to know about your racial or ethnic group? What, would, what do you want people to know, or what might be surprising to people about your racial or ethnic group? So the first is, what is your, your, your race or your, uh, your ethnic group? Two is, what do you like about being your race or your ethnic group? Third is, what is embarrassing about your race or your ethnic group? And thirdly, what do you want people to know or what might be surprising um, to people about your racial or ethnic group? Yep, the first one is what is your racial what is your racial or ethnic group? So how would you define yourself?
I'd like you to do now is I want you I want to give you about three minutes to talk at your table about those four questions. Talk at your table about those four questions. as you were having conversations at the table, what came up for you? Anything interesting? Anything, any questions you had? Anything come up as you were having <coughs> conversations at your table? Were there some questions that were easier to answer than others? Okay. Were there some that were more difficult, obviously, than, than others? Yes. All right. where, did find, where did folks find the most difficulty? The last one. Number four. Yeah. Number four, which was what? What is it that people don't know about your, your culture or what might surprise you? Okay. Number two. Number two. Which was the question about what? What do you like about being your race? Why might that be one of those questions that causes us to pause or, or have a hitch? Well, we might have difficulties doing it. Yes. Because it might be embarrassing. What might be embarrassing? All right, so she says she put that she's white, and then she said that there's more opportunities, and that's what she liked. Well, right. It's a little embarrassing. It's embarrassing to admit that. That's true. Right? So other people are shaking their, head, shaking their heads, too. It's embarrassing to admit that. But is it a choice? But is it a choice? Is what a choice? Okay, 
So is it a choice? Is it's a gift. University in, in the Twin Cities that uh, teach um, uh, education classes. So, you know, one of the, the students got really frustrated when we were having this conversation. And he said to me, he said, Andre, um, I feel like I'm the new oppressed group. I'm a white male. And it seems like everything is my fault. And I'm mad about it. He said, I can't get a good job because they have this affirmative action hold back. I, I can't, which is not true. He, he said, I can't, um, I can't get a scholarship because they have all these things for these minority groups. I'm mad. And guess what I said to him? You should be mad. But you're mad at the wrong person. You're mad at the wrong people. And so he said, well, well who should I be mad at? I said, do you really want to know? He said, yeah. Who should I be mad at? I said, if I tell you, it's going to change your world. Are you sure you want to know? And he said, yeah, I want to know. And I said, okay, here it comes. You should be mad at your eighth grade soccer coach. He was like, what? I was like, yeah, yeah, eighth grade soccer coach. I said, because when you were in, in eighth grade, did everybody get a ribbon at the end of the season? He said, yeah, they did. I said, at, at the end of the season, did everybody get a trophy for something? He said, yeah, we did. I said, you know what they've done? They've tricked you. He's like, well, what do you mean? I said, let's talk about this holdback stuff, right? This affirmative action stuff that people keep bellyaching about, that uh, the people who are bellyaching it, about it now are going to need it in 15 years. They just can't see it because it's going to be necessary for them as demographic, demographic shift and change. Uh, and, and so I said, let's talk about this, this holdback. I said, what's the percentage? Are they holding back for these so-called minorities that you're talking about? I said, is it 100% of the workforce? He said, no, it's not 100 I said, is it 50% of the workforce? He said, no, it's not 50. I said, is it 25? He said, no, it's pro that's probably high. He said, it's probably around 10%. I said, so it's a 10% holdback. I said, with that 10% holdback, you should be angry. Because by giving everyone a trophy, what we've told people is that they're better than they are. And so his problem isn't with the 10%. His problem is because he can't compete with the 90%. And so instead of saying, I'm inadequate to, to compete with that 90%, that I'm going to look at this 10% and I'm going to blame my existence on them. And people do that with poor people all the time, right? Uh, poor people are ruining the economy. They're wrecking the economy. They're, they're, um, you know, they're siphoning wealth out of the economy. Well, I will tell you, guess who benefits the most from food stamps? Walmart. <laughs> Of public employers. Who do you think has the largest number of public employees on assistance? Walmart. So all to what? So that, 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 that concept of whiteness, what, what, what I was trying to get my student to understand was that the problems he was facing was because he is a, uh, he is a white uh, male and he is facing these things, but it's because the systems weren't even designed for him. The systems were designed for the owning class. So if you do exactly what the owning class do, that anyone see the great Gatsby? No matter what he did to, to, to rise above his situation, it was his pedigree that mattered more than even his money. So we have to pierce those illusions so that we can get to people's humanity, so we can restore people's humanity. And so what I did was uh, I passed out some cards. 
And, um, and if, you, if you have cards at your table, and they say number one, can you please uh, can you stand if you're, if you're able? So we're going to do an experiment, and I want the rest of you to pay attention to what's going on um, in, in this experiment. And uh, number one, I want to say thank you so much for being brave enough to stand up and participate in this activity with us. Um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. You guys are absolutely fabulous and stellar. Um, and the, the game is really simple. What I want you to do is I want you to, uh, in that pack are some cards with numbers on those. And those numbers are the value of those cards. So, uh, so uh, does everybody at least have four cards? You at least have four? Okay, great. So I want you to tally up your, uh, your totals, and I'll come back to you in, in just a second and give you more information. All right? So count up your cards, the value of those points on the cards. All right? And you can give us a rough, rough estimate. You, you don't have to be an accountant. Uh, you can give us a rough, rough estimate. All right? Um, th there should be some twos. Do I have twos? Can you guys stand up twos? All those who have two packets, there should be another table. I, there should be one more. Okay, I've got two tables. Um, now, I, I do want to say thank you for your participation in this activity. Um, and what I'm going to need from you guys is to, to really focus on um, trying to accumulate more cards. Okay? And so count the number of, of cards. Does everyone have at least four cards? At least four cards, yes? Okay. Um, and then we'll start a trading round. What we'll do in the trading round is we'll have you um, introduce yourself to someone. Once you've shaken their hands, you have to trade something. And you're trying to accumulate more points or more values. All right? Is that pretty clear, two group? Is that pretty clear, two group? Okay. All right, cool. All right, you can have a seat. Thank you so much. And there are some people who have threes. Please stand up if you have threes. If you're, if you're able to stand up. Well, I am so glad um, that you people could make it today. And I know you might have some difficulties understanding the process that we're engaged in. But I'm sure as you do your trading that you won't steal. Right? Can you promise me that you won't steal from other people? Can you, can you do that for me? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I didn't hear everybody. All right, good. And I, what I want you to do is I also want you to be very polite when you interact with other people, okay? So uh, we, we practiced our manners before, and this is a great time to use them. Do you understand what I'm saying? I didn't hear everyone. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, is, are there any questions that I can answer right now? I didn't think so, so thank you so much. Um, please, please stay, stay, I didn't say sit down. Did you hear me say sit down? No, man, you can sit down. <laughs> so, um, and I'm going to need you guys to really focus on your area, okay? Uh, because you've got a lot of work to do back there. We're, 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 we're going to help you, all right? So, um, one group, did you guys count your, your cards? All right, great. Um, does anybody need additional cards? Uh, okay, cool, so you're good, all right, cool. Uh, two group, do, do you have your cards counted? All right, cool. Um, the objective of the game is to do what? Get more cards. So you have to shake, once you shake hands with someone, you have to trade a card, right? Um, in, in, in that three group, I forgot to ask, do you at least have four cards no, you don't have four cards? Well, that's on you, because you should have came prepared, okay? <laughs> you should have came prepared. All right, um, so what I'd like to do, we're going to do three rounds of this. Uh, the first round will be about a minute or so. The second round will be about 90 seconds. And then the third, third round will be a speed round, okay? So um, if you could um, begin trading. Actually, let me check my timer. If you can begin trading now. You have one minute for trading. Now the rest of you, I want you to pay attention to what's going on.
30 seconds. So Freeze, how did you do? Not good. No. Yeah. Don't 
for him, we, we kind of expected that from you. But just know that I do have another program I can put you in that will help give you some more tools that can help you become better. Okay. Um, group two, how did you do? How'd you do? Group two is getting quiet. Good, you're good. Okay. You had your hand up earlier, sir. Oh, it's, it's not important. I just needed an extra group member. So that's not important. Thank you, though, for asking. All right. uh, group one, how, how are you guys doing? Doing really good? All right, cool. Are you finding it easy to trade? Okay. What was that? Now that you caught on? Okay. okay, so yeah, more points, or it may equal more cards, but it may also be more points. All right, cool, cool, cool. I said we would do three rounds, but I think the lesson has been learned in, in this, this round. Um, so um, if you could just put all your cards back in the packets. At, at a break, I'll have you just dump them off uh, up here. Um, for the rest of us, what, what did you notice? <laughs> So some people are learning how to utilize my system. What else? You treated other people differently. Yeah. So the, car, the people with the most cards and the, 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 the most number weren't trading with anybody. All right. What else? Yes, in the back. People were being blamed for their lack of success. The way that I, the, the patience level, the way that I spoke to people helped determine that, that stuff, right? What else? Yes? Group three didn't sit down the last time. Conditioning works. <laughs> Group three didn't, they didn't sit down the last time. And not only did they not sit down, they didn't try to sit down. <laughs> right? They didn't leave their area. And they didn't leave their area. What else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, she. So get back to where you belong. Now, I do want to tell you, I hope you understand I was play acting. <laughs> so don't meet me in the hallway and body check me or something. So I was play acting. What is this a simulation of? What, is, what, was, this, what was this designed to, to kind of get us to think about? Institutionalized inequality. So institutionalized inequality, right? What made the game work? So they didn't step out when they found out it wasn't socially acceptable. What did the two group do? You know what? We didn't say anything. We didn't right here. We didn't say a word, did we? What did the rest of you say as you were watching this unjust system play out in front of you? Yeah. Nothing! We're talking about ourselves here, but we didn't about it. I know. That's true. That's true. You didn't know that you could make a difference, but who said that you couldn't? We just observed. You just observed. You just watched. This plays out in our society all the time. We are so, and, and to be quite honest, cannot make anybody do anything. No, I'm just the dude in front of the room. I don't have any power or control over any of you. What made that game, that simulation successful, was the audience's implicit silence in watching the game, and then the participants not rising up and saying, we're not going to play this stupid game. Yes, ma'am. What do the numbers mean? Nothing. nothing. They mean nothing. There's 
no winner, there's no loser. It's just a game created by me. And you all played along. What do you think would have happened if someone had, because I actually had thought that a young lady in the back with the scarf, what's, what's her name? Tanya. I thought Tanya was coming up here to protest. She, she actually did have a question. I thought she was going to say, I'm not playing this game. And I was waiting for at least somebody in the room to come up and say, this is wrong. We're, we fight for, you know, we fight for, blah, blah, blah. But do we see how easy it is to, to fall into the, the, this trap that is set for us? And so when we think about this, when we think about uh, what, what, what it means to be a particular race or a racial group, I, I want you to think about a stereotype about a, a group of people, a stereotype. You know those things that we, you know, we don't like to talk about, or we hear other people talk about. And we go, ooh, don't say that, right? So I want you to think about that stereotype. Uh, these people are drunks. These people are thieves. These people are getting over the system. I want you to think of one of those stereotypes. Now I want you to uh, shake your family tree and see if any of those stereotypes fall out of your family tree. <laughs> Whatever we can say about another group of people, we can say about our own group, and we can probably even say about our own family. We're more alike than we're different. And it's through these obstacle illusions that we think that we can't make a difference. And so what, what we understand is that poverty sucks. It sucks. Right? But it only sucks because we typically are implicit in our response to tools. Um, can you imagine what it would be like if, if there was a poor colos home in our neighborhood and our neighborhood and our neighbor said, you know what, I got a hundred dollars. Let's get let's get two hundred people to give a hundred dollars, we can save this house. Can you imagine what that might, what, what that might look like? Or, or we can say, you know what, uh, we can't get the house, but we can get the land. So let's do a land trust for our neighborhood group. So, so we'll do a land trust, and you can buy the house, and blah, blah, blah. Many of our CAP programs, that's part of what we, we aim to do, right? To get people into affordable, affordable houses, houses that they can afford. Because they may not be able to afford the land, but they can afford the house. And so it, it's up to us to speak out and to do something, right? I'm in a grocery store, and uh, I, I tell this story not because I want you to do this, but it's, a, it's an example of how, as individuals, we can shape the world. We can rock the world. So I'm in a grocery store. No, I'm, I actually starts at the dollar store. So there's a, a young couple, and their race isn't important, uh, but it adds a little color to the story. So they're, uh, they're an African-American couple with a little baby, and they're under 20, right? So they're under 20. Uh, whether they're married or not, I don't know. It doesn't really matter, but, but they have this little baby. And so the, the woman uh, pulls out of her basket an apple juice at the dollar store. So she puts it on the counter. And something captures the young man's attention. So he's looking at some shiny thing. And, um, and so she takes out her EBT card, and she's in mid-swipe. And all of a sudden, the dude turns around, and he says, You stupid boo! You are so boo, boo, boo! And boo, 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 boo! And so he's just going off with this lady. And he's getting puffed up, and the more he curses, he gets puffed up. And guess how she responds to this? She doesn't. Which lets me know that this isn't the first time this has probably happened. And so, like everybody else in the store, I say the same thing to myself that everybody else is saying. And what are they saying? None of my business. So we're all looking at prices at the dollar store. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's looking at this, this different stuff. And, uh, and then this always happens to me. I don't know why it happens to me, but the voice speaks. And I'm like, ugh. And the voice said, say something. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and the voice says, speak. And I'm, and I'm like, okay, I don't know what to say. And by this time, I'm having this conversation with the, with, with the boys, and they've just in, exited the store. And I'm like, oh, they're gone. And the voice says, say something. And I said, okay, okay, boys, uh, I'll make you a deal. If they're still in the parking lot, when I'm done with my transaction, I will go say something. And so, so I'm standing there, and uh, I'm taking my time. And the cashier is like, will you come on? And I'm like, mm -hmm. And, and so 
go in and I finally finish the thing and they're out in the parking lot. Um, but the guy just picks up, takes a phone call. So he's on the phone and he's still rah, 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 rah. And, um, and I said, okay, voice, I will say something if he gets off the phone before I get to my car. Right? So I'm trying not to, I'm trying to walk casually, but trying not to look at him to, you know. And, and so um, I don't make it to the car, and they're now going into a grocery store. So I follow behind them in the grocery store. Now, I will tell you, I'm smart enough to know that you don't walk behind somebody, tap them on the shoulder and say, I want to talk to you. Right? So, so I go around an aisle, and I meet them face to face. And I see the young man. Now, I find it very surprising that the voice had all this encouragement until I'm face to face with this dude. And now the voice is being silent. So I don't know what to, I don't know what to say. I've never, I've never been in a position like this before. I, I, I don't, you know, I do know that if I say the wrong thing, this lady is going to catch hell when she gets home. So I'm like, okay, I don't want, I know, I don't want to do, okay, so I, I don't know what to say. And so uh, the voice is quiet. So now I'm stalling until the voice, like, kicks in. And so I'm, and I said to the young man, you know, sir, can, can I talk to you for a second? And he's like, what? About what? And I'm like, I'm like, you know, it's all good. You know, I put my ears down, I tuck my tail a little bit. You know, so I'm kind of sure I'm not threatening. And so uh, so I said, sir, I, you know, if we could just take a step over here and we can have a conversation. And so we take two steps to the side, and um, which is the social cue for the mom and the baby to, to, to go a little further so we have some private public space. And so we're standing there, and, and you know, I've stalled as much as I possibly can. I'm getting nothing. And then the voice says, open your mouth. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I open my mouth, and I said, sir, can I, can I share something with you about women? If you want her to grow, you have to give her sunshine, and you have to give her water. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but I have no idea what that means. <laughs> and so I repeat it. I don't repeat it for him, I repeat it for me. <laughs> and so I said, sir, if you want her to grow, you have to give her sunshine and you have to water her. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> he deflates. His prickles go away. And he looks at me and he says, yeah, I do. All right, sir, great job. I have a great day. I'll talk to you later. I did what I was supposed to do. I'm out of here. I'm not trying to sell you Amway. I don't want to make you part of my multi-level marketing scheme. I'm, I'm out of here, right? And so I, so I leave. And it took me a couple of weeks to figure out why I was compelled to speak on that particular day in that particular moment. And I know that all of you are, are way smarter than I am. And maybe you picked up on it a little faster than I did. But why do you think I was compelled to speak? Just to calm him down. Just to calm him down. Why else might I have been empowered to speak? Protect her. To protect her. Her child. The way you were raised. It was the way I was raised. It's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. When I figured this out, it really changed how I interact with the world. It changed how I think about my relationships to other people. And the, the reason that I did it was because there was a small child involved. You see, long gone are the days where we give a man a fish. And he eats for what? A day. Long gone are the days where we teach a man a fish and he eats for a lifetime. We're now at a point where we need to start teaching generations how to manage lakes and streams. And so well, sometimes we forget as practitioners that when we're helping an individual, we can actually be breaking generational curses off their lives. People often ask, why are poor people poor? Have you ever heard people ask that question? Well, I flip the question around. Why are rich people rich? And why are they rich? Because they were born that way and they were taught by rich people how to be rich. Who teaches poor people how to be poor? Other poor people. 
And so when we start thinking about this, we, we have to recognize that we have an individual responsibility to speak up. I was in, a, in another grocery store at another situation. I don't know why these things happen in grocery stores. I don't know what that's about. But I'm in a grocery store, there's a woman um, in front of me, and then there's a woman in front of her. And the woman in front of her um, has a basket full of groceries, and uh, she's wearing a hijab. So I, I can only uh, imagine that she is uh, Muslim or, um, or Somali or you know, an Arab in some way. And she's got five kids, and her English isn't that great. So she's trying to negotiate um, these five kids in the candy aisle with a cart full of groceries. Right? And so she's going back and forth with the, with the lady, and the lady in front of me is acting what my grandmother would call uh, acting a fool. <laughs> and she's doing this. <sighs> I, I wish these people would. You know, she's doing all this murmuring and stuff. You know, they're kind of right about what is that. So she's doing all this stuff. And so I'm standing there, and I'm like, oh, I got this. I know what this is. I do this on a day-to-day -day basis. I got my PowerPoint in the car. I got some handouts. So I can make this work. Right? So I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, that's not, that's not real logical. So I go back to my teaching, and I do something that I know works. I know that people don't like being watched, even though they want to be on America's Next Top Model and all these different shows, but nobody likes being watched. So I stand there and I go, <clears throat> what happens to the woman's behavior? It stops. It stops. I didn't have any big signs or protests. I, I, you know, I didn't make a big, big situation out of it. But when she was able to recognize that people heard her and saw her, she decided to change her behavior. Now, it, did I change her behavior for the rest of her life? I don't know. But in that moment, I stood up and I said something that caused some cognitive dissonance for her. I did that. I'm in a bar restaurant. And, um, and it's 10.30 on a Saturday morning. I go in to grab my lunch. I had a bunch of errands to run. And there's a guy that's already in the bar, and he's red-faced and drunk, sitting at the end of the bar. I close my menu. The dude moves from the end of, bar, the, end of the bar and sits right next to me. And he says, you know what? I don't like niggers. Now, I'm thinking that's one heck of an introduction. I don't know how you... Where do you go from there with that, right? And so, so I'm standing there, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, and, uh, and so I do what any good Minnesota would do, which is what? Change the subject, right? <laughs> so I change the subject. So we start talking about other stuff, and, uh, and so I, I come back to this. You know, something in my spirit say, go back to that. So I said, sir, when you use that word, what are you talking about? He said, I'm talking about ignorance. I'm talking about uh, people who uh, don't know how to act. I'm, I'm talking about uh, people who don't, who, talk, who don't talk right. People who like rap. Who, people, you know, so he goes through all this list. And then I asked him, I said, sir, do you know any white people who fit that description? And he said, yeah. I said, how about those Vikings? You know, and so we start talking about the Vikings and all this kind of stuff. And then he, he, he leans over to me and he says, you know what? I don't like niggers, but I like you. Now, I'm not quite sure what to do with that either. It sounded kind of like a compliment, but I'm not sure, right? So, so, I, I, so I say that. I, so I, I, I say to him, well, sir, what do you like about me? What makes me unique or different? And he said, well, you have a, a good head on your shoulders. You're educated. You, um, you know, uh, you can communicate well and blah, 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 blah. And, and, and so I said, well, sir, what if all the people that you've met that you think look like me, all the ones that you've met that you think look like me were idiots. And everybody else that you haven't met that you think looks like me is just like me. And he looks at me and he says, I gotta pee. <laughs> so he gets up and he goes off the, into the bathroom. And so now I'm feeling pretty good because I haven't had to, you know, fight or any big confrontation or, or whatnot. And so I, uh, so I get my stuff and I'm headed out the door. And guess who meets me at the door? It's this guy, right? And he has a damp napkin, and he looks at me with his damp napkin, and he says, I raise chickens. If you ever need fresh eggs, give me a call. And he hands me the napkin. I take the napkin. I go my way. He goes his way. I didn't call him. <laughs> but what happened for him? That was his apology to you. 
change of attitude? What was that? I said, I think that was his apology to me. That might have been his apology to me. Would you have understood if I had given that dude a piece of my mind for calling me a nasty name like that? Would you have understood if I went off on him and said, you can't, what, what was wrong with you? Would you have understood if I did that? Yeah. But had I done that, I would have done what? I would have reinforced everything that he thought about people who he thinks look like him. And so when we start talking about how do we move, how do we change things, how do we stand up in the face of all of this stuff, how do we do it? Well, one of the things we have to do is recognize people's humanity. Sometimes we want to be right and we don't do the right thing. Has anyone ever heard someone say, well, don't be a doormat? Has everyone ever heard somebody say that? Right? What do they mean by that? Don't let people walk over you. Don't let people walk over you. Please raise your hand if you have a doormat in front of your house right now. <laughs> Doormats serve a purpose. They serve a purpose. What, and what is that purpose? Wipe your feet. So part of the transition, right? So you wipe your feet so once you get past that doormat, you're clean as you go to your next stage. And so sometimes people need to get that stuff off on us so that they can go past us with a clean conscience or with a, a, a new way of, of being. And what do we do when, when our doormats get too, too dirty? We shake them out and we put them right back where they go. Right? And so sometimes we don't want to be a doormat so much that we don't give the opportunity for somebody to get their stuff off before they go past it. So there are three, uh, three concepts I'm going to leave you with. Uh, before that, there's a, uh, a, a chart that's in your handout. And the chart talks about barriers to humanity. And across the top of this chart are categories. African American, European American, Latino American, uh, Asian American, Disabled American, and Native Americans. And what I'd like for you to do is to tell me what the groups on the left taught you about the groups going across the top. And the way that I want you to do this is I want you to put a plus if they taught you something positive. I want you to put a minus if they taught you something negative. And I want you to put a zero if you never had a conversation about that at all. You can have pluses and minuses in the same box, but the size of your plus or the size of your minus will dictate how much you learn. So a big plus means you learned a lot of positive, and a little minus means you learned a lot of negative, or a little bit of negative. All right? So I'm going to give you uh, just a couple of minutes to do that. You may begin now.
stop right where you are, but I'd like for you to just have a conversation at your table about the, uh, the pluses, the minuses, and the zeros. All right? environment that you grow up in shapes you.
Okay, so just in, in terms of generations, things have changed between generations. Okay. Someone else? Yes. So you, so you learned a prejudice outside of the home from your experience with other, other people. Other people. Okay. Not, like I said, not my own, but I, was, I guess because I didn't have that Okay, so so um, the question was, what does it mean when someone says that your background shapes you? So we live. Where do we live? What state do we live in? Minnesota. Where is Minnesota? In the upper Midwest of what? The United States of America. The United States of America is where? Is in North America. And North America is in what hemisphere? The West Hemisphere. Right? The West Hemisphere is connected to the East Hemisphere, and both hemispheres are on what? On Earth. Yes. Okay. And they need to see your mouth. All right, great. I was trying to use more of the microphone to do that, so. Okay. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> at least somebody wants to look at me. Yes. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, North America, Minnesota, United States are all a context. We do things here in Minnesota that they don't do in Florida. Right? There's so much this shovel. Right? So our environment shapes our behavior. So when, when they say that, that's what she's referring to. That the environment you grow up in shapes your behavior. Um, and so because... We grow up in Minnesota. The snowmobiling is big. Winter sports are, are big because we have winter for seven months. Right? Um, and so that, that's what she's talking about. So, so how, does that trans, how does that translate to everyday life? Right? So if I grow up in a rural community, I know about rural stuff. So in, in, uh, in Ohio, where I grew up, we had this thing called town tipping. tipping. But we would sneak up on cows and knock them over. And sometimes we'd kill them because they'd have a heart attack. Right? <laughs> That's, that was the wives' tale. Um, and so your environment dictates your behavior. And that becomes your cultural context. So as contexts change, so do the way that we, we're supposed to interact. Why is it that we do not have dinosaurs today? Because they could not, what's that? They could not adapt to the new context. Which is why I'm so glad that, you know, sometimes people need to die. Just <laughs> <laughs> that's some, sometimes the only way to get rid of that stuff, you know, is to die. Right? So, um, but for example, there are people who call Brazil nuts by another name. Well, I got the hush and be like, yeah. <laughs> right? So, for those people who, who don't know, uh, Brazil nuts are these uh, orange wedge looking nuts, and they're, they're wood. I mean, if it, 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 the shell is like wood, and, uh, and they're dark brown, and they were uh, referred to as nigger toes, is, is another way that they are, they're talking about. And, uh, and so, 
Is that acceptable to say now? No, no please do not. Right? But we may have relatives who, who still call it that. And so how do we how do we deal with that? How do we uh, how do we address that? If I said, you know, grandma, grandpa, you can't say that. No, 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 no. What what what's their pushback gonna be? That's what we called it. That's what I'm gonna call it. And you can't tell me what to do, the little whippersnapper. Before you were, you know, you were born. I was born. Right? So we just go off on that stuff. And so, so context becomes important. It was acceptable then, but it's not acceptable now. So how do we get those people to come to the now? Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. One of the things I do want to leave you with with this particular activity. If there are things that uh, you, you don't know about, or things that um, people tried to teach you that were negative things, or, or maybe positive things, I, want to, I just want to tell you, it is not your fault what you know or what you don't know. That's not your fault in terms of what people tried to teach you or what your limited context had to offer you. It is, it's not your fault. But how many people have driven or ridden in a car does that automobile have a blind spot? Yeah. And typically, where is that blind spot? Sometimes it's right behind you, on the side, sometimes it's in front of you, and if you drive a Hummer, the whole thing is a blind spot. <laughs> is that blind spot your fault? No, it's not your fault. But when you get in that rental car, and you sign for that car, you say, I am responsible for everything I can see and everything that I can't see in that car. So although the blind spot is not your fault, it is your responsibility to do something about it. And so whatever it is on that paper that you know or you don't know, or misinformation that people have given you, or lack of exposure your context has given you, it's not your fault. But it is your responsibility to make sure that you fill in those gaps, that you stand up for somebody, that you love people. Three concepts I'm going to leave you with. One is bigotry. Um, and bigotry is one of these classic kind of concepts that we attribute particularly to an American uh, character named Archie Bunker. <laughs> and uh, most of you are not old enough to have watched that on television, but Archie Bunker was this kind of blue-collar, cranky, uh, old white guy who didn't like anybody that wasn't like him. And when he met anybody that wasn't like him, he met anybody that wasn't sitting in his chair. <laughs> So anybody who wasn't sitting in his chair, he didn't particularly care for. He was opinionated. Oftentimes he was wrong. And what I've been told about bigots is that uh, they are ignorant. Has anyone ever heard that? Someone say, well, bigots are ignorant. And so when I've interacted with a bigot, what I've done is I've brought information. And I say, bigot, you're wrong. Here's some data. Bigot, you're wrong. Here's some statistics. Bigot, you're wrong. Here's some more information. And the more information I bring, the more they dig in, and the more they dig in, so they finally get tired of my information, and then they tell me what's wrong with them. And they say, Andre, I don't care what you say, this is how I feel. Oh, that's what bigotry is. Bigotry is an emotion. Does data change emotion? So, so you have a sad friend, a friend with the blues. I'm not talking about clinical depression. Just, just the blues. You know, we get it sometimes, right? But what do you do to bring that friend out of the blues? You help them feel better by doing what? What do you do? Make them laugh. You make them laugh. So you tell them a joke. What do you do? You hang out with them. You go shopping, you go you know, buy some chocolate, you go bungee jumping, skydiving, you do, you do something that takes them out of it. And, and if you gave all of those things a sum total, I would say that you love them out of that sadness. And so it, emotions move emotions. Information doesn't move emotions. So how do we move a bigot? You love them. I'm not saying you don't take. I'm not saying you take their, their stuff. You don't you know take you know you don't take stuff from people you don't have to take. But what I am saying is, is you say, particularly if it's a person in your family or, or someone uh, in your circle of influence, you say what you say. A person 
I'm a bigoted person. I'm not going to let you go. I have some boundaries. Don't cross those boundaries, but I'm going to continually be tethered to you. Because do bigoted people get better once you cut them off? No, they get sick. As a matter of fact, they go find another group of sick people, and then they start breeding. <laughs> a whole new sect of the crazy. Right? The second concept I'm going to leave you with is, uh, is prejudice. And I was always taught that prejudice was good. I had found out as an adult that prejudice will save your life. So I, I'm walking down the street. It's 1130 at night. There are six guys coming towards me. What decision do I make? I cross the street. Why? Because I'm prejudiced. I have prejudged the situation. And you would say that's what kind of a decision? A wise or a smart decision. But now I take that same decision and I'm at a grocery store. And there are six people coming down the aisle towards me. What decision do I make using my learnings from the street? I go down another aisle. But when I go down that aisle, what do I see? Six more people. So what makes sense in that context no longer makes sense in this new context. And so what prejudiced people do is they take something that made sense out in that context and try to apply it as a strategy for living in another context. Uh, an example, you, you hear people say, well, I know uh, five Native Americans, so, and they were drunks, so all Native Americans are drunk. That's problematic. The logic is bad. Right? And, and what makes the logic bad in that? It's a stereotype. What else? Not everybody's the same. So I'm taking these five and I'm giving the word all. So anytime you hear someone say A-L-L, you know it's a problem. Right? So I'm saying this whole group is just like these five people. But here's the other part that, that's really uh, problematic about the logic. My granddaddy used to say, birds of a feather flock together. So I'm concerned if you know five drunk anything, Why do you know all the drunks? Why, why is that? <laughs> so how do you change? How do you change? So, so prejudice is a thought. It's a set of thoughts. So prejudice is a thought. How do you change a thought? How do you engage a thought? Anybody have teenagers? When's the best time to talk to a teenager? <laughs> in the car and I stop talking to teenagers I don't talk to teenagers anymore I don't even talk to them I don't say anything to them well I say stuff to them but I don't talk to them because they don't want to talk they want to text and they don't want to text me but this is what I do to teenagers and they can't stop it it drives them crazy I ask questions why is that? I'm sure you've seen these law shows, right? So you have these lawyers, these high school lawyers, and they're in the courtroom. And this lawyer knows that everybody's not going to take this question. It's not going to go over. It's not going to fly. But this, the, 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 the attorney stands in front of the, the jury and says, jury, I want to ask this question. And then the, the, the defense says, I, I want to strike that. And the judge says, you know, uh, sustain. And then they, they, they say, the, the attorney says, you know, I'll take it back. I'll just take I'll withdraw that question. Why does the attorney withdraw a question that he knows is going to be uh, refuted by, by the other side? Why does he still ask the question? He put the thought out there. Because the once you put the question out, you can't take it back. And so when I meet and in, when I'm in, interacting with prejudiced people, I ask a lot of questions. So they say, well, you know, these people, are, so where did you read that? Is that true about all of them? Uh, can I find that article? Can you show me where that is? What, what, what's happening with that? Really? Okay. Wow, that's interesting. Um, have you ever thought about this? And, and once you start doing that, what does the prejudiced person start doing? Oh, that's too much. Don't make me think. 
And lastly is this concept of discrimination. And discrimination is a behavior. And who said that they would take care of discrimination? Whose responsibility is it to take care of discrimination? I'm walking down the hall, and one of my coworkers swats me and grabs my bottle, and we're not on the softball, on the, on the softball team together. Who do I see? I'm at work. This is grab and squeeze. Who do I report that to? HR, human resources. And if I don't get satisfaction there, I take it to the courts. And the only people who can get the satisfaction in, in, that, in that stuff would be the legal process. And so the law, the government says, we will take care of discrimination. Is there a law that says how people can think? No, there is no law that says how people can think. Is there a law that says how people, uh, what emotions people can have? There is no law that says what emotions people can have. Is there a law that says how people can act? Yes, there is. And so if the government said that they will take care of discrimination, um, and, and, and they wrote a law about it in 1964, it's obvious that we have no more discrimination. Yay! <laughs> Do we have discrimination today? Can you tell me why? We haven't changed people's thoughts and their emotions. And whose responsibility is that? Hours. If you haven't gotten anything from the, 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 the crazy ride that we've taken this morning, what I do want you to take from this is that it's important that we recognize other people's humanity because there is dignity and honor in being human. Dignity is something that you have and something that you give to someone else. Honor is the highest level of respect. That we, that we reserve for people who have done things for us that we could not necessarily do for ourselves. <coughs> being, please raise your hand if you passed a test or you purchased a ticket that made you eligible to be born. <laughs> None of us did anything to bring ourselves here. We're all trying to figure out what it means to be human. And there are two things, well, three things about humanity that I'd like to share with you as I close. One is that my humanity can only be humanity when I am in authentic relationships with another human. It's questionable if I'm human on a deserted island all by myself. I was waiting for this song to come on a long time ago. <laughs> right? So that's questionable. What else is questionable is Back you can't go on. <laughs> What's your favorite song? <laughs> All your money's gone. <laughs> you feel back as a loose. Okay. <laughs> so, humanity. So, my humanity can only be expressed when I'm in direct, authentic relationship with other human beings and when I am in the service of those human beings and not just primarily in the service of myself. So, when I'm in the service of human beings, my humanity gets magnified and my, my humanity gets recognized when I'm in relationships with other people. The other thing about humanity, the third thing about humanity that I want you to walk away from, is that no matter what race, creed, color, social economic status, uh, gender, um, uh, gender expression, you are always, 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 always human. My name is Andre Cohen. Thank you so much for your time.